Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to do a summary of the adaptive immune system with focus on the lymphocytes, that is, B cells and T cells, or B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. I find that there's a lot of confusion with the adaptive immune system, and there's a lot of differences between these cells and cells of the innate immune system. So before we get into this summary, which is pretty much everything you need to know on the next two slides, I want to preface some differences between the cells of the adaptive immune system like these and then cells of the innate immune system. When we think of cells of the innate immune system, that is white blood cells, we're thinking of neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and so on and so forth. Okay? And these cells are going to be constantly floating throughout the blood. Okay? In fact, some of them can actually take up residence in tissues, but really those cells of the innate immune system, a lot of them are actually going to be in the blood. Okay? And they're constantly patrolling, looking for things uh, that require attack, looking for things that require an immune response. Okay? And they're also not specific. Okay? They'll pretty much attack anything that falls into their uh, repertoire. In contrast, the adaptive immune system is very specific. And here's one big difference. These cells of the adaptive immune system, that is B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, these cells are not generally in the blood. Okay? They are actually in what we call secondary lymphatic organs. That kind of a picture of that right here. Um, we usually use green for lymphatic organs, but that's beside the point. These lymphatic organs are things like lymph nodes, the spleen, uh, and also lymph nodules that we see on the surface of some organs. So long story short, these cells are not going to be generally found in the blood, at least at first. There's one exception. They're going to be in secondary lymphoid organs or lymphatic organs, and they only become activated once we have antigen presentation. Now, if you want more detail on antigens or antigen presentation, go back and watch uh, some of the previous videos in this playlist. I'm going to assume that you understand what an antigen is, and also antigen presentation. So the first cell that becomes activated is what's called a helper T cell. We usually abbreviate this by having a capital T and a subscript H, helper T cell. The best way to think about helper T cells is they are the generals. If you think of the ranks in the armed forces, okay, uh, these guys would be the generals. They're calling the shots. They do not directly attack anybody. They don't attack anything. They just begin and coordinate the immune response against a specific pathogen. Okay? Now this pathogen has an antigen. Okay? Uh, it's already been phagocytized by an antigen presenting cell such as a macrophage. And this macrophage is now about to present this antigen, this orange triangular antigen, to this naive helper T cell. So a couple things there. One, this orange triangular antigen, this is actually going to be in this example, uh, from the bacterium Staphylococcus aureus. We're going to use that as an example. And when I say that this helper T cell is naive, that just means that it has not yet been exposed to or sensitized to uh, a specific antigen. Okay? At this point, prior to antigen presentation, this just sits there and it does not target anything specifically. However, that all changes when this naive helper T cell gets presented this antigen by this antigen presenting cell. It could be a number of antigen presenting cells that kind of just float through the blood and into the lymphatic system and ultimately to the secondary lymphatic organ where this is taking residence. As soon as this antigen presenting cell shows this antigen from Staph aureus to this helper T cell, this helper T cell becomes activated. Right? Now we're going to start basically an immune response. And the first step of that is this helper T cell initially is going to start secreting a cytokine called interleukin-2, which we call IL-2. Interleukin-2 is going to do two things. One, it's going to cause these cells, these helper T cells, to proliferate. Proliferate just basically means to divide and start making a bunch of copies of themselves. Because if we're going to have an immune response against a pathogen like this, we need a bunch of cells, so proliferation. It's also going to trigger, that is interleukin-2, these helper T cells to differentiate. Okay? To differentiate means to transform into a slightly different kind of cell. And we're going to get two types of cells 
uh, from this differentiation. We're going to get one, a memory helper T cell, and two, an effector helper T cell. What's the difference between these two? Memory helper T cells really don't do anything for the immune response at that moment. They just hold a memory of this antigen. So now this cell, this memory helper T cell, it remembers this Staphylococcus aureus antigen. And so after this initial exposure, if there was any other subsequent exposures years down the line, this memory helper T cell would remember this antigen. Okay, But it does not directly attack anything. Then we also have this effector helper T cell. This one is going to be the active general. Okay, this is going to be the active general of this specific immune response. Again, helper T cells do not directly attack anybody, but this effector helper T cell is now also sensitized to and activated against this antigen. And so now this guy right here is going to coordinate the immune response specific to Staph aureus. All right, now we have an effector helper T cell. This is going to start the immune response, and it's going to do so in two ways. An effector helper T cell secretes two cytokines. One is going to be interleukin-2, and the other is going to be interleukin-4. So first we're going to focus on this interleukin-2. What does that do? Well, we've got some naive cytotoxic T cells just floating around. Okay? So T sub C, that means cytotoxic T cell or cytotoxic T lymphocyte, and right now this cytotoxic T cell is naive. Again, it has not theoretically been exposed to the antigen yet. Okay? But assuming that, again, an antigen-presenting cell has exposed uh, this Staph aureus antigen to the cytotoxic T cell, if this cytotoxic T cell receives this interleukin-2 from the effector T cell, this cytotoxic T cell will also proliferate and differentiate. Okay? And it will proliferate and differentiate into two subclasses of cytotoxic T cell. One is called an effector cytotoxic T cell, and the other is called a memory cytotoxic T cell. Again, this takes place in the secondary lymphatic organ. And these memory cytotoxic T cells, these are just going to hold a memory of these uh, antigens from the Staphylococcus aureus, and so if you were ever exposed to Staph aureus, again, years down the line, a subsequent exposure, then you have these memory T cells that are already sensitized to that pathogen, and so your immune response the second time would then be faster. Along the same lines, we have effector cytotoxic T cells. These are going to be the infantry of your army. So while the effector helper T cells were the generals that are calling the shots, basically by releasing interleukins, the effector T cytotoxic cells, these are going to be the ones that actually carry out the D. These are like your foot soldiers, your infantrymen. These, as we'll see on the next slide, are actually going to migrate to the site of infection and they're going to kill that bacterium directly through apoptosis. They're going to induce that bacterium or whatever cell it is to undergo apoptosis. So really with these cytotoxic T cells, uh, in order for them to become activated and proliferate and differentiate into the memory and effector cytotoxic T cells, they have to have two things. One, they have to have an antigen presented to them so they know what to attack, but they also have to receive this signal of interleukin-2 from the generals, the effector helper T cells. Okay? Now that's the cytotoxic T cells. Now let's go over here and look at B cells. So B cells are going to function differently than cytotoxic T cells. Okay. Um, they're still going to require input from the generals, the effector helper T cells. So these effector helper T cells, in addition to interleukin-2, they're also going to secrete interleukin-4. Now B cells are sensitive to interleukin-4, but they generally require two things to become activated. One, they need the antigen. Remember that B lymphocytes are phagocytes, meaning they can perform phagocytosis. So they can actually phagocytize the staph aureus if it makes its way there, and they can actually get the antigen that way, and that's how they can become sensitized to that specific antigen. Okay, So that's the first thing, they need the antigen. And the second thing, of course, is they need a signal from the general, the effector helper T cell, and that signal is interleukin-4. 
And assuming that this B cell becomes sensitized to this antigen through whatever means, and it gets the signal from the effector helper T cell via interleukin-4, this B cell will then proliferate and differentiate. One cell that B cells differentiate into is a memory B cell. Okay? Memory B cells function very similarly to the memory helper T cells and memory cytotoxic T cells. They just remain in the secondary lymphoid organs and await a secondary exposure to the pathogen. Okay? And when you have that subsequent exposure to that pathogen, in this case, Staphylococcus aureus, then you get a much faster response because you have these memory B cells, memory of the pathogen. The other cell type that B cells differentiate into is actually not an effector B cell, although they basically might as well be called that, but they're specifically called plasma cells. Okay? Now, plasma cells function very differently than effector helper T cells and effector cytotoxic T cells. So we already know what effector helper T cells do. They're kind of like the generals, they call the shots. They trigger an immune response basically by secreting interleukin-2 and interleukin-4. And when they secrete interleukin-2, we get activation of effector cytotoxic T cells, which go directly to the site of infection and kill the bacterium by inducing apoptosis. In contrast, plasma cells don't actually leave the secondary, secondary lymphoid organs. They still stay there, but what they start doing is secreting antibodies, okay? And so the antibodies then exit the lymphoid organ and ultimately go into the lymph and the blood and make their way to the infection site. And then those antibodies then tag the pathogen, and then there's other things that we've talked about that can happen from there. So these guys, these plasma cells, don't leave the lymphoid organs. They just start making antibodies and secreting them, and then the antibodies flow into the blood and in the lymph, and they ultimately migrate to the site of infection to tag and facilitate the destruction of the pathogen. Okay, So again, we have memory cells in each of these for the subsequent exposures, but for right now, when we're actually fighting the infection, we have our effector cells, effector helper T cells, which are the generals, effector cytotoxic T cells, which are the infantrymen, which go directly to and kill the pathogen. And then plasma cells, you could kind of think of like the Air Force or, or someone who's firing missiles from afar. Okay, They're not actually going and fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, but they're launching a missile. They're launching those antibodies, and then those antibodies then go directly and, and target the pathogen. So here's kind of what's going on. Again, uh, the plasma cells you can see right here, that's the cell that's generating antibodies. Okay? So the antibody is just going to be secreted, and it's essentially just going to go into the blood. Okay? It might go to the lymph first and then the blood, but that's not the, that's not the point. So the antibody is going to be traveling ultimately through here to the blood, and then it's going to go and exit the blood into the, uh, into the uh, damaged tissue out here, and it's going to actually attack and bind to the pathogen. Now, the effector cytotoxic T cells function differently. These guys don't actually stay in the lymphoid organ. Uh, they're actually going to migrate to the site of infection. But with all the blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, how do these effector T cells know where to go? Do they just go there randomly, or do they just have a path that they follow? It turns out they have a path that they follow. Okay? So here's our infection site. Here's Staph aureus, our pathogen. Now, remember, from the innate immune system, there are cells that are already uh, probably taking up residence um, in the site of the infection. Those are macrophages. Macrophages are already there. Neutrophils are pretty quick after that. But whenever these cells, such as macrophages, start digesting these pathogens and killing them, the macrophages are going to release chemicals called chemokines. Now here's a point of confusion, cytokines versus chemokines. Cytokines, like interleukins, or IL-2, IL-4, these are chemicals that are going to induce changes in the functions of these cells. So they may actually cause these cells to differentiate, they're going to cause them to divide. Those are the two major things that cytokines cause. In contrast, chemokines really just cause different cells to migrate to the infection site. And so this effector cytotoxic T cell is just going to migrate and make its way all the way to where the pathogen is by following the chemokines. So it's just going to follow the trail. 
And essentially the way this works is, if you've seen that thing on Family Guy, ooh, piece of candy, ooh, piece of candy, with James Woods. Ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. That's basically how this effector cytotoxic T cell gets to the pathogen. So it's not actually a random movement, it's actually following the trail of chemokines as shown right here, okay? So hopefully this video made sense to you. Hopefully you understand where each of these lymphocytes is in the adaptive immune system, what their functions are, and also how they're triggered to become activated and proliferate and differentiate. And hopefully you understand that effector T cells actually do migrate specifically to the infection site and kill via apoptosis. They're like the infantrymen. Plasma cells secrete antibodies, but they don't go to the tissue. They're more like the people that fire missiles or long-range weapons, and then effector helper T cells are going to be the generals that call the shots. Okay? Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.